Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Campbell speaking and welcome to lesson 1.2.2b, Inverses of Functions Continued. So we're going to begin today with a, another example of um, finding an inverse, kind of reviewing what we learned in our previous lesson. We're going to add a few more things to our previous lesson today and, uh, and kind of finish up this topic. So the first example today says, find the inverse of f of x equals 2x squared plus 5 for x less than or equal to 0 using the switch and solve method. Check your answer using the graph and a point. All right, looks like we had a couple of things to do here, so let's begin. The equation is y equals 2x squared plus 5. And I'm going to come back to this section right here in a little bit when I'm finding the inverse. Um, so when I do that, remember to find the inverse using the switch and solve method. We have to switch, so here goes the switch, x equals 2y squared plus 5. And now the solve portion of that. To solve that equation, I will first subtract the 5. And then secondly, I'll divide by 2. And then, of course, take the square root. Now, why, when you take the square root of two sides of an equation, never forget that it's plus or minus. And then it's x minus 5 over 2. Now, because I needed a plus or minus, we would say that this particular function was not invertible because this is not a function. However, this statement here tells us that we're only going to look at half of this graph. So if I'm thinking, and I'm just going to roughly sketch off to the top here, if I think about what 2x squared plus 5 looks like, if I graphed it, it would look like this. It is inverse would look like this. It is not a function. That's what the graph of this thing looks like. So what we do instead is we say we're only going to look at part of it. In fact, we're only going to look at the values of x that are less than or equal to 0, which is this little segment right here. So if I want the inverse of that, that's going to end up being this little segment down here. That will then have an inverse. So for the function itself, x is less than or equal to 0, but that means for the inverse, because you switch x and y, y is going to be less than or equal to 0. So when we get to a situation of plus or minus, if we have this additional piece of information, we are going to choose. Is it the plus or is it the minus? And the answer in this case is y less than or equal to 0. It's the minus. So our inverse function, f inverse of x, is going to equal the minus of x minus 5 over 2. Now, if that had said greater than or equal to 0, then I would be picking the positive. So part 1, there is the inverse. Part 2, it says to check your answer using the graph. So if I were going to use the graph, I'd ask you to pick up a calculator and type in this, whoops, I don't know what I did there, this original function and this new inverse function that we just wrote. And you know what the graphs are going to look like? I kind of penciled them in already. It's going to look like this with the part shaded being what I showed. Now, it's hard to do that on a calculator with the 2x squared plus 5. It's hard to say. Just graph the left side of it. It can be done, but there, there is some syntax to that that you probably don't know how to do. I can't even remember myself how to do it. Um, but that's what it would look like. The other thing we're supposed to do is check our answer using a point. So I'm going to use a point right now, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back to my blue, which is the original function, and I'm going to do f of some number to figure out what my y value is. Keep in mind, I should only be looking at x's that are negative. So I think I'm just going to do f of negative 1 because it says x less than or equal to negative 1. And that would give me 2 times negative 1 squared plus 5, which would give me a negative 1 squared is 1 times 2 is 2 plus 5. That would be 7. And now what I want to know is for the inverse function, if I plug in 7, do I get out negative 1? So let's see what happens. I'm going to plug in a 7 into that equation. It would give me negative square root of 7 minus 5 over 2, which is negative square root of 2 over 2, which is 1. And of course, that is in fact negative 1. And check, it works. If it works with the graph works with a point. So that was sort of a summary of what we did yesterday. And by the way, be sure to put the date at the top. I don't because I don't know what date you're watching this. Um, and so if you're watching a day is different than others. 
Um, so that's going to lead us to our formal definition of what an inverse is. Now, before I actually even get into that formal definition, I'm going to play a little game with you. All right, so I am going to ask you to take a number. I want you to think of a number, any number you like, and I'd like you to add four to that number. Okay, so got a number? Add four. Now take your result and subtract four. What did you get? Now hopefully you're thinking, well, duh, I got the number I started with, right? Now let's do it again. Take a number, you think of a number, any number you want. Ready? Take that number and multiply it by five. Okay, got it? Now divide that number by five. Did you get the same result again? Okay, one more time, here it goes. Take a number, any number you want, square it. And now take the square root of your result. Again, did you get back what you started with? And I hope you did every single time. The reason I chose those three examples is the first one involved adding and subtracting. The second one was multiplying and dividing. The third one was squaring and square rooting. In each of those cases, those are inverse operations. And what happens when you do an inverse is you get back what you started with. And that's really where that formal definition comes from. So I'm going to go ahead and fill in the formal definition. And please do that with me. So a formal definition says two functions, f and g, are inverses if and only if, here goes, f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x. So let me explain what the definition tells you. So say that in the example I just gave you, I said adding 4 and then subtracting 4. Say the function g is the function that adds 4, and then f is the function that subtracts 4. Start with any number, we'll call it x, add 4 to it, then subtract 4, you get back x. You get back with whatever you started with. That happens in both directions. Same example if I said multiply by 5 and then divide by 5. So g is the function that multiplies by 5, and f is the function that divides by 5. When you do one and then you undo it and then you get back your original thing, which we called x, that's what it means to be inverses. Now what you're going to notice here is that what we have is the composite of two functions. So that's how these connect. When you do the composition of two functions, if you get back what you started with, in other words x, then they are inverses of each other. So in other words, if f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x, then they undo each other, like adding and subtracting, multiplying and dividing, squaring and square rooting. Only typically functions have more to do than that. And that's what we're going to look at in our next lesson. So it says here for the next questions, use composition, that is this and this, to decide if the following pairs of functions are inverses. So when I look at problem number one, I see a multiplication by three and an addition of five. In part two, or g of x, the other function, I see a division by three with the threes in the bottom and a subtraction of five. It's actually five thirds. It kind of feels like they might be inverses, but I'm not 100% certain, so I'm, of course, going to check. So here's what we're going to do. Now, we're going to show that they are inverses. To decide if they are inverses, we're going to show lots of work here, and I'll be expecting to see all of that work. So here goes. I'm going to write f of g of x. In other words, I'm going to do that. So this is that first thing that I have written right here. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to show all my work and see if I get x when I do. So here goes. f of g of x is the same as f of 1 third x minus 5 thirds. And then I'm going to go to the function f and I'm going to plug that in for x. Well, the function f says take 3, multiply it by whatever you're going to put in. We're going to put in 1 third x minus 5 thirds, and then we're going to add 5 to it. And then we're going to clean it up. And you got to show all the work for cleaning it up. So I'm going to distribute the 3. That'll be the first thing I do. 3 times 1 third is 1, so that will give me 1x. 3 times negative 5 thirds is minus 5. Then there's a plus 5. These, of course, zero out, and we get back x. So going back to the definition here, does it satisfy this definition? And the answer is yes, it does. f of g of x is x. However, as you know, with composition of functions, the order matters, right? So just because f of g of x is x does not guarantee 
the g of f of x is x. So I have to do that one too. So two things to do. Thing two, g of f of x. Here it goes. g of f of x is equal to 3x plus 5. And then I'm going to go to the function g and I'm going to say 1 third times 3x plus 5 minus 5 thirds. And like in the last one, I'm going to distribute. So 1 third times 3, that's 1. So I will be left with 1x plus 1 third times 5 is 5 thirds. And then there's minus 5 thirds. And those are going to zero out. That's going to leave us with x. So are they inverses? And the answer is yes, they are. Now I will be asking you to show me the work. Now what I'm going to ask you to tell me, and this is really important, so please listen carefully. It is really important to me that you, first of all, tell me what you're going to do. That's what this statement is right here. Tell me what you're going to do and then do it. If you are one of those people that wants to skip steps, the only step I'll allow you to skip is this one right here. Okay, you can skip that one if you can do that in your head, but you do need to show me this one, this one, and this one. You may not skip this. This is you telling me what you're going to do. This is you doing it. This is you telling me what you're going to do. This is you doing it. That's necessary. So please make sure you're showing me those steps. All right, we're going to go ahead and do some more examples, some more pra practice with that. Just a second and look at that definition. It says the word and right here. And the word and means both things have to be true. Let's take a look at example number two. In example number two, boy, they don't look like they're inverses. And the reason I say that is because we have a multiplication by a half and a multiplication by four for the inverse, an adding of three and an adding of six for the inverse. So my gut is that they are not going to be inverses, but we're going to show that they're not inverses. So how do we do that? Well, let's first write down what we're going to do. We're going to do this, f of g of x. And then we're going to do it. That is f of g of x is 4x plus 6. Then we're going to go to the function called f, and we're going to do 1 half times whatever we replace with x for x. That's 4x plus 6. And then at the end, an adding of 3. That will give us half of 4x is 2x. Half of 6 is 3. Oh, then we get another 3, and we end up with 2x plus 6. This is the composite function. If they are inverses, the composite function will always result in x because the two functions then would undo each other. Did we get an x here? We did not. Is it necessary for us to do the g of f of x? And the answer is no. And the reason it's no if I go back, so if one of them is not true, I don't even care about the other one. These are not inverses for sure. All right, let's go on to our example number three. In example number three, boy, just I'm going to glance at it and see if I have any kind of inkling for it. For example, this one is a squaring. This is the other one is a square root. This has a times five. This has a divided by five. This has a subtraction of seven. This has an addition of seven. My instinct is that, yes, they are going to be inverses. But I will tell you that just because you have all of those things present, does not mean that they're inverses because the order in which you do them also matters. So for example, if you had a divided by at the end, maybe that would change things. So just kind of keep that in mind. I also want you to note, although we don't really have to pay great attention to it, this thing right here, x greater than or equal to zero, means that I'm only going to get half this parabola. Without that, the function is not, or the inverse is, it's not invertible. Um, so this is greater than or equal to zero, and this is positive. So I think we're going to be okay there. Okay, so keep that in mind. It's there because it has to be. We don't really have to even look at it, though, in this type of problem. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do f of g of x. What do I get when I do that? I get f of the square root of x plus 7 over 5. And then I go to the function f, and I say, well, that's 5. Then I encounter an x, which is, is going to be the square root of x plus 7 over 5. And it's going to get squared. And then I'm going to subtract 7. Now, I kind of hope that it's all going to go away and give me what I want and all of that. But before you can actually show that, you do have to show me that in steps so that I know that you know the order of operations. The first thing that has to do is it has to get squared. Now, squaring a square root just makes that all go away. That's awesome. And then what's going to happen next? The 5s are going to go away. 
that's awesome. Multiplication and division come next, leaving us with x plus 7 minus 7. And then order of operations, those go away. And we're left with just x. So check, we got what we needed there. You do need to show me that many steps. You can't just do it in your head. When you're trying to demonstrate or show somebody work, you have to show all of the work. Now, not enough, of course. I still have to do g of f of x, which is g of 5x squared minus 7. Now, that step you don't have to write. It helps me so I know which function I'm you know, substituting into. I like that, but you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Now, I'm making that substitution. So you'll see that I replaced this x here with all that stuff. And then I have to go order of operations again. Now remember the order of operations when we have a fraction with a long bar, there are parentheses here. I'll have to do that first. So the first thing I'm gonna do is add and subtract the seven, so those are gonna go away. Then I'm left with five x squared over five, and yes, you have to show that. Then also, when you have a square root of a big old fraction like this, there are parentheses here, so we have to clean up inside there first. In other words, take the, those fives and divide them out. Then what I have after that is just the square root of x squared, and we get x. Squares and square roots undo each other, and so that will just be x, assuming that x is positive, but I don't actually have to assume it, because you know what? It says that right here, x is positive. So check, are they inverses? The answer is u, that they are inverses and my work verifies that and proves it now look at example number four as we continue on in looking at example number four what's your gut tell you well i see a cube and a cube root that's good i got a minus two and a plus two also good I got a plus four and a minus four also good instinct is telling me that yeah they're going to be inverses but are they always i don't know let's find out so what are we going to do we're going to do f of g of x. Always write down what you're going to do, and then here's me doing it. Um, and again, if you don't want to write this step, you don't have to, but I just think it's a good idea, so I'm doing it. That's what's going to go in for x. So what's going to happen when I write down my function for f? I see a parenthesis, and then there's an x. That x is going to get replaced by this whole thing, which is the cube root of x plus 2. Make sure that bar goes all the way over that. Minus 4 is outside of that. And then also in there is a minus 2. And then it's cubed. And then an add 4. So we got a lot of stuff here. All right. So what has to happen first? Well, we do have a set of parentheses. So we have to undo what's in the, or we have to simplify what's in the parentheses. That is a minus 4 and a minus 2. I'll combine those. So cubed root of x plus 2 minus six, that's gonna get cubed and then add four. The next thing that we'd have to do would be to cube this, because we do have parentheses on the x plus two, but there's nothing we can do with that. Now it's super tempting, guys, to cube both of the things that are inside the parentheses, but you can't do that because we don't distribute an exponent over a subtraction. If it were a multiplication, we for sure would, but we can't do that here. So what we would actually have to do if we wanted to find the result would be to take the cube root of x plus 2 minus 6 and multiply it by the cube root of x minus 2 minus 6 or plus 2 minus 6 and then a third time, um, which ends up being a mess. And I'm going to guess that you can probably figure out that in doing that, it's not going to equal x. It's actually a big old mess. Are these going to be inverses? The answer is they are not. Even though my instinct was yes because the operations were inverses, the order was not. So these are not inverses. Even though it looked at first like they were going to be. Turns out, mm, bummer, they're not. All right, so last page coming up, guys. Last page coming up. All right, so now what it says in our final examples, it says, let f and g be inverse functions and let f of 7 equal negative 2. Which statements below must be true? Now, before I even look at any of those statements, because there's just a whole lot of different things, I want to just write some notes at the bottom of this about what I for sure know. I know that f, because it's given, f and g are inverses. So f and g are inverses. That is guaranteed by the question. Now, I know a couple of things based on that fact. Thing one that I know 
is that their graphs are reflections over the y equals x line. Now, none of these parts have anything to do with graphs, but I definitely know that anyway. I also know that their tables are going to be flipped. So in other words, if I have some function f that has a certain x and a y value, um, say for example that this is a and this is b, then the inverse function g has a table of values where this is b and this is a. Okay, so that's interesting to know. And I'm given some question up top. So that's going to lead me to say this. In the original problem, we're told that f of 7 equals negative 2. What that means is that 7 negative 2 is on f, right? So what's on g? Well, if we know that and we know that they flip, then we know that negative 2, 7 is on g. That's kind of nice. Okay, so we know that too. That also means that g of negative 2 equals 7. Okay, now that's all stuff that we learned in our previous lesson. So we have thing 1, given that they're inverses, we know about the graphs, we know something about the tables, and today we added on the formal definition of inverses, which is that f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x. In other words, they undo each other. All right, let's take all that together, guys, and see where we come up with when we start to look at these nine different choices about what is true and what is not, because the statement says which statements must be true. Okay, so take a look at the first one. Does f of g of 7 equal negative 2? Now, to illustrate what, whether this is true or not, I want to come back down to this statement right here. It says they're inverses, so we know that f of g of x has to equal x, which means they undo each other. So what would f of g of 7 have to equal? It would have to equal 7. It can't equal negative 2. That is not a true statement. Cross it off. All right, what about the next one? g of negative 2 equals 7. Well, we said that already, or right here. g of negative 2 equals 7. That's because we know that the inverse is going to reverse those points. That was from our previous lesson. So is that going to be true? Answer, yes, it is. So that's going to be true. I'm going to circle it. C, g of 7 equals 1, uh, one 7. Um, we don't know anything about g of 7, for example, but we certainly can't assume that to be true. The reason it's a choice is because some people think that inverse means reciprocal. It does not. It does not. So we don't know that to be true. We're just going to cross it off because it's what must be true. Uh, letter D says f and g can't be inverses because 7 is not equal to negative 2. That's just a ridiculous statement. We already know they're inverses. That was a given statement. So we can cross that one off. Letter E. f of g of 7 equals 7. To answer that, I'm going to come back down to this statement right here f of g of x equals x means no matter what you put in, you're going to get back out. So this has to be true for any value of x, including the number 7. f of g of 7 is 7, so that is absolutely correct. Next one says g of f of negative 2 equals 7. Again, if I come back to this statement here, whatever you start with, you have to end up with because functions undo each other. So if g and f are inverses, then g and does f, so you should get back negative 2. And in this one, we don't. Not true, or not necessarily true. In letter g, we do, because g, you input a 14, you apply the function g, you apply the function f to the result, you get back what you started with. That's what it means to be inverses. That one's going to be true. And then, of course, this is the formal definition. And finally, this, because their inverse is going to equal x, this, because their inverse is going to equal x, they both equal x, they're certainly equal to each other. That is true as well. All comes from those three facts that we have about inverses, that their graphs are reflection, we didn't even use that, the tables are flipped, and that the functions undo each other. All right, that takes us to the end of this lesson. So um, good luck with the homework, and we'll talk to you soon.